Howdy there, folks. I'm Quinn of Snazzy Labs. As technology increases at an incredible rate, our once shiny Macs become a little dusty. We either, you know, put them on a shelf and never touch them again, or we sell them for scraps on Craigslist or eBay. But there's actually a better use you can make out of an old Mac, and I'm going to show you that today, turning it into a home server. Now, I have in front of me a 2009 MacBook. It still is a great machine. It's really loud. And the hard drive is clicking, which worries me a little bit, so that's probably on its way out. But other than that, it's a really good machine. The CPU is respectable, and it will actually serve its purpose fine as a macOS home server. How are we, are we gonna do this? Well, we're gonna use macOS Server, which is an application provided by Apple. Now, if you look in the App Store, uh, this thing has 1.5 out of five stars. That is truly horrible. Uh, one of the lowest rated apps in the Mac, store, uh, Mac App Store period, uh, especially made by Apple. Now, part of the reason why people are so pissed is because it used to be a really, really powerful, truly enterprise level uh, kind of piece of software. And now it's really been kind of truncated, trimmed down to be more of a home server type app. And so for pros, they're pissed that it's been kind of neutered. But for people like us, it actually becomes a really great, useful app. Now, here's the thing. The version that you use greatly depends on the operating system version that you're running. MacOS Server was sold as a separate operating system uh, up until um, the Lion days. So as of Lion, they combined macOS and macOS Server into a single OS, and then you had to pay a license fee to unlock it. And then as of uh, several versions ago, they began selling it as an independent app inside of the macOS App Store. So it's $20, and this is the weird thing. So you need to purchase the application on a Mac that's running 10.14.11 or 10.14 or, or newer at the point of time of this video. So if you don't have 10.14 or newer, uh, you will not be able to buy the app. Once you buy the app on a new Mac, you can go to install it on an old Mac. And you'll see that once I click this button, install Mac OS server, I'm running El Capitan on this machine. It's going to say, hey, look, you can not install the latest version of this app. But would you like to download the the last compatible version with your operating system, we're gonna say yes and click download. Now this works if you're running El Cap or newer. If you're running an older version of Mac OS, so Mavericks or older, you are going to have to find it through Apple's uh, old, like uh, antiquated support document, server 3.2.2. And uh, so I will link to that down below and how to find that version of Mac OS. You have to go to the web browser, click a link, and then it opens a special page in the Mac App Store. It's very janky, but it does work. So once you've got that downloaded, you're going to open it and then we'll configure it. And I'll let you see what we can do. So before we open Mac OS Server and actually start configuring stuff, we need to make sure that our network settings are set up correctly. You really should use an ethernet cable if you have the ability to. Using Wi-Fi is really not ideal when you're running a server kind of based environment. And so you should use a wired ethernet connection. Also, if you have a much older Mac and you're on a 10 100 uh, ethernet card, it's not a gigabit ethernet card, you should look online to find maybe a Firewire capable uh, gigabit ethernet card that will greatly speed up the rate at which your server can distribute files and information to other computers on your network. Once you've got that figured out, we're going to need to open network preferences. Now, uh, if you click on Ethernet, it will show you your local IP address. Now, mine is 10.1.10.197. Yours is probably 192.168.1. something, a number zero to 250. Um, and this is good. This is what's been generated automatically and assigned by your router. The problem is, is that we need to manually define the IP address on our network because we need to let the other computers on our network know where they can always find our server. If the IP address is always changing based on when this thing reboots or every few days or weeks, that's going to become an issue. So we are going to click use DHCP with manual address. And what I would recommend is that you use the exact same address that's been automatically assigned to this machine. So it can be any number from zero to 250. We'll just do 10.1.10.197. If you don't know what your IP address is or you want to give it a different one, you can give it any other IP address you want so long as it's not the same as another computer on your network. To check to ensure that it doesn't have the same IP address as another computer on your network, you can open terminal and then you can type the word ping. So that's to send packets and then receive them back. So we can ping. Uh, for example, let me do my local server here, my 
you know, 336 terabyte server. This is the IP address of that server. So when I ping it, I am going to, uh, it's gonna send packets and then receive them back. If I press control C, it will give me a summary. So I transmitted eight packets, I received eight packets back. That means that there's zero packet loss and therefore that IP address already exists on the network. Now, if I tried, I don't know, ping 10.1.10.153, uh, press enter, uh, it is not receiving any bytes back. There's a request timeout. So it's trying to send packets, they're not coming back. That's 100% uh, packet data loss, which means that IP address is available. So we can do 10.1.10. .10. Let's do 153 for this MacBook. And there we go, apply. That is going to be our new server IP. You should really make yours something easier to remember, like 192.168.1.2 or not five or whatever. Uh, but that's a great way to make sure that you're not taking or attempting to take an IP that's already been used. Once we've done that, it's time to open Mac OS Server. So we can find it in Launchpad. It opens as a standalone app and it will ask us to continue, which we will press. We agree to give uh, Apple all of our organs and everything that uh, is, is definitely theirs when we agree to this end user license agreement. Okay, that took a lot longer than expected. Uh, before we get into really the cool stuff that this can do, we need to configure it properly. And so we are here on the main page. We have MacBooks MacBook. That's what my device is called. That's pretty terrible. So we're going to change the host name to, uh, let's change it to home server maybe, or server.local. I'm not going to use that one because we actually already use that here at our office. But uh, you could use whatever one you want. We're going to choose to use the Ethernet network rather than Wi-Fi. We're going to do local network. And then we're going to call it uh, Mac server. That's what we'll call it, Mac server, okay? And then we press finish and we change the host name of the computer and it's going to change the name of the computer and the, the name of the share so that now on all other Macs and our iOS devices and even Windows devices, because this is SMB capable, which is pretty cool, uh, which is the Windows file sharing protocol, uh, it will appear as Mac server and it will be accessible to every device on our network. Holy smokes, this takes a long time. All right, that took a lot longer than expected. We're gonna hit the settings tab and enable some form of remote access. What does this do? Well, it allows you to remotely access your computer. This is helpful not only if you don't have a monitor or keyboard or display because you're using like a Mac mini or something, but even in the case of this MacBook, which does have all those things, uh, it's nice because then I can just put this up in my attic and every time I wanna change or modify something, I don't have to go up there to do it. I just can control it from another Mac. Um, and so that's exactly what we're going to enable. SSH is an option, which is great if you use Windows computers, it allows you to access it from really basically any device or Linux device. And then there's screen sharing and Apple remote desktop. Those are natively built into Mac OS. So on any Mac, there's an app called screen sharing. You can find it in Spotlight or your utilities folder, and then you can control your server. Last thing you can enable is Apple push notifications. You're going to need an Apple ID and password and then certificate that's signed to this device, but you'll get push notifications on your iOS devices, on your phone, for example, uh, when you know parts of your server stop working or you have a drive failure or your time machine backup stops working. Really cool stuff that you should probably enable. And that's pretty much it. Now we need to add some users. So there's one user installed by default. This is called MacBook Server. And the MacBook Server account is the administrative account. Now we can add other accounts and uh, other users, which is what you're going to want to do. Um, if only because you don't want to run the admin account generally when you're accessing files and stuff like that. Uh, so you'll want that just for your own use, but you can make separate users for every person in your house, for example. So your kids or your uh, spouse or, or whomever can have access to a different local store on your network so they can store their own files privately separate from yours, which is pretty nice. Um, so we're going to add a new user just for example's sake. And we're going to call this account uh, test. We're going to call the account name test. You can add email addresses. You can add a password. We're going to make the password test really secure. And then you can choose whether or not to make them an admin and where their home folder is going to be stored if they have a home folder at all. So if they don't have a home folder, that means they have no file access other than the main shared directory. Uh, we do want to give each user file access. So we're going to let them use the local storage. And then we, you can also limit how much space they have. So that's kind of handy as well, but that's good. Then we're going to click create. Now, 
What we're not going to do that you probably should do because this is generally uh, good server hygiene is to add every user to a group. And then you'll modify the group's entire permissions. So what they can access where, uh, you generally do that to a group. But to me, because there's not gonna be that many people using this, I'm just going to do it on a per user basis. I know uh, sysadmins are freaking out. That's okay, I don't care. So we're gonna right click on this test user and then we can change edit access to services. By default, new users have access to literally everything. And that seems, uh, that's kind of the antithesis to normal servers. Usually you have no permissions until they're enabled. This is the opposite. You get access to everything, but you can restrict stuff. So let's say I don't want my test server having SSH access or screen sharing access or, uh, you know, messaging access or, or whatever. And so I can disable those, press OK, and then I manage. And then that allows me to do that. Um, so once we've created groups and users, we can actually enable our services and choose what users have access to each service. Now there are a lot of services on here and I'm really only going to talk about the ones that I think normal people are going to use in their home. <laughs> There's some pretty cool ones that do really advanced stuff, but generally you just, you don't need them. The first one is Time Machine. Time Machine is cool and everyone probably uses Time Machine. You plug a hard drive into your Mac, it automatically backs stuff up super handy and nice. There used to be a product that Apple made called Time Capsule. It was a Wi-Fi router with a time machine hard drive built in. That's gone now, Apple doesn't sell that, but you can mimic that exact same functionality using macOS server. So what it allows all of my computers to do is back up over the network to one local storage device. This means you don't need a hard drive plugged into every single computer, you just let them back up over the network to the device that's plugged into your Mac. So I can turn the service on this is also another weird thing. Uh, in macOS server, you turn this, the service on before you can modify them. Normally on other servers, you modify the settings and then turn it on. This is the reverse. Um, so this is a new time machine store and I can choose where to store the backups. So I'm gonna store them right now just in my uh, desktop. This is not a great spot because it's on my internal hard drive. You're generally gonna wanna plug in a different device and then back up that way. Um, but I can limit e the size of each backup. I'm not going to do that. And then I just press create and it will create a time machine store. And what's cool about this is that I can give permissions uh, to some users or all users or certain groups. And so what that allows me to do is give backup time machine permissions to the test account. And so test can now update their time machine backup on their Mac. And so on the Mac, you on a different Mac, you go into system preferences, you enter time machine, and then you can actually select this computer as the time machine backup location. This computer handles all the storage. You can actually click back up here once they begin backing up. You can see all the devices that have backed stuff up on your network. You can manage them, you can restore them, you can delete them. Really, really, really handy to have one shared backup location. Okay, so time machine's cool. The next thing that you're probably going to want to use is caching. Caching is friggin' sick. And I, it's a little difficult to display, uh, to explain. We're gonna turn this on. Um, it's enabled automatically by, or it's not enabled by default, but it's configured automatically. Uh, and there's not really anything you can do to change it. But what this does is it works with iTunes, the App Store, and iOS updates to automatically cache those files. So every time my phone, my iPhone, asks for an app update, rather than going directly to the internet, it actually goes through my server, through this computer first, and then it goes to the App Store. The App Store says, okay, you don't have that app update yet, let's give that to the server. And then the server stores that update local, or that app update locally on the network. And so any other iPhone or iPad device that wants to update that app, rather than asking uh, the internet every single time to download it from the App Store, which increases the amount of bandwidth that you use on your home internet uh, plan, and then also is slower than locally servicing something from the network. It's a way, your local area network is generally much faster than your wide area network downloading from the internet. And so you can just automatically serve those app updates to other devices from this computer once it's been downloaded once. It's really cool. It works for Mac apps too, iOS apps as well, iOS updates, which is pretty neat. And uh, yeah, it's just generally really awesome. Uh, it's super handy when you have multiple Macs and they all have an update. The app updates once to this computer and then distributes from there to all the other machines on your network. It's fast, it saves data, it's absolutely wonderful. It's caching and you should definitely enable that. Okay, next, file sharing. File sharing is enabled by default. Uh, it will appear as the name of your server on any other Mac. Um, and uh, cool. <laughs> so what exactly can we do? Well, we're gonna give permissions to uh, 
some users or all users, and then when they're connected to private networks, local networks, or all networks, you can open your server up to the internet so that if you open the correct port on your uh, router, you can access uh, these files, not even just from your own home network, but from afar, which is pretty cool. And um, this files app, or this file sharing functionality integrates to the iOS files app as well. So not only can you share files between your Macs, but also from your iOS devices, which is really pretty neat. Um, now you can choose which folders to share. Uh, by default, it has shared the desktop and the MacBook server's public folder. So let's say I don't wanna share the desktop with people on my network. I'm gonna subtract that. And then uh, this SharePoint may be used for Time Machine backup. So we're just kidding. We're not gonna remove that. Um, but uh, we do have this MacBook server's public folder. So this is a public folder that is accessible by iOS, SMB, which is a Windows share, uh, AFP, which is Apple File Protocol, that's what macOS uses. And then um, you can choose to allow guest users or not. We're gonna say no guest users, so you have to log into your account in order to access this. You press OK, and holy smokes, what happens is now on any other iOS device or any other Mac on our network or Windows computer, you'll see that the macOS server appears, you click it, and then it will ask you to log in. You'll need to log in with a user account that has access to that share, and everyone will get access to the MacBook server's public folder, so everyone in your house can share files in between each other. But then you can also have each user have their own individual files that they can access on file sharing. This is like a local network drive uh, for any device you want in your house. A really great way to share stuff rather than uploading to Dropbox or iCloud Drive or whatever. On newer versions of macOS server, by the way, you can replicate iCloud Drive functionality as well. So not only does it cache and store on iCloud, but also stores locally. And it won't request that file from iCloud so long as it's on your local uh, computer. Really, really freaking cool. The last thing that, well, normal people are probably going to use is uh, VPN. Uh, VPN, if you use one and if you have one, uh, this allows every computer on your network to go through this device as the network device. So you can, you can basically add a network-wide VPN to all the computers on your network. Now, most routers now will do this, so I don't know that most people would prefer this method, especially if it's an older Mac with, without 10 gigabit ethernet or, or gigabit ethernet functionality, than rather just going through their router, but um, it is an option as well. And then there's a lot of other crazy stuff, like you can create a local wiki. There's not much use for this in a home server environment, but I've turned the wiki on, it's starting, and this quite literally allows you to open in Safari a Wikipedia style website that is uh, an intranet. So it's, it's accessible from any device on your network. If we open this in Safari, it is the name of your server dot local. Um, so it's gonna open to Mac server dot local. Any device on your network can go there. Uh, we are going to accept the certificate and Mac server dot local is going to show us this uh, wiki, which we can modify and add information to. Uh, it's great for like small businesses if they want to add information on payroll or, or whatever. Um, is a pretty slick system there. But that's pretty much wiki functionality. I don't know that most people would use that. And other than that, that's uh, pretty, that's pretty much the extent to what normal people are going to use. You can do locally hosted messages or mail or contacts or calendars. I would not recommend this now that iCloud is so good. Um, you can also do uh, host a website. So if you have a website folder or directory, you can actually host that on the internet online uh, by enabling that. I generally would not recommend that. Um, but there are a number of other features that are available in macOS server. So poke around, play with it, but at very minimum for $20, this allows you to resurrect an old Mac. And then especially if you run this in conjunction with something like Plex Media Server, uh, or many of the other applications that allow you to use this old computer as a host device, it becomes kind of an end all be all of computers on your network. One old computer to rule them all and to serve all the networks in or all the computers in all the land. That was probably one of the lamest uh, endings I've ever done on any video ever, but do you know what? I don't care. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, well, that other button seems to work okay too. Let me know what model of Mac you're going to resurrect to become a Mac OS server. And as always, stay snazzy. See you later, folks.